Morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started with our media Zoom this morning, and I'll turn it over to Coach Eilert. Good morning, everybody. Um, just want to recap the Florida trip. Um, I thought for the most part, we had a lot of positive moments. Um, outside of a 10, 15 minute stretch against SMU, we played uh, pretty good bat, pretty good basketball, uh, considering, you know, the challenges we're facing. And so um, I'm very, you know, pleasant, uh, pleasantly surprised at uh, Wednesday, pleasantly surprised. I've, I've been happy with uh, the way we're competing. You know, I'm excited the way we're competing and the way we're we're handling these challenges, but we just got to figure out a way to, you know, get over that hump and 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 figure out a way to be more disciplined down the stretch, uh, take care of the ball a little better, and, and figure out a way to come out of these games with victories. Uh, so I've been very encouraged uh, with uh, the way we competed the last couple games, and you know, certainly not the outcome we had in mind in terms of, you know, coming out of a, a two game stretch in Florida, but uh, it is what it is at this point. We're two and three. Now we got to move forward with uh, four games at home and take advantage of our home stretch. Uh, yesterday we had to take the day off and uh, due to NCAA rules. So we took that day off. We spent some time as a team together and, you know, had a, had a nice meal and, and even went bowling and spent some time together and, uh, you could tell that the guys needed a day off. You know, we, I believe I got in bed at 4 a.m., you know, coming back uh, from Florida. So uh, travel's never easy and, and it never seems to be, everything seemed to be delayed. And we had to fly in and out of Pittsburgh rather than Clarksburg. So got us in a little bit late and, and got in bed by about four. Uh, so like everybody slept in yesterday and yesterday afternoon, we spent some time together, did some bowling and, and, um, got a good night's sleep last night. So we're going back to work today, the folks on, um, Bellarmine and, and focusing on them today and tomorrow and getting ready to, uh, take on, uh, you know, a good solid basketball team. that's coached very well on Sunday afternoon. So excited to have the next four games at home, you know, really need Mountaineer nation to, to back us and support us and, and show up and, and give us that energy that, uh, we need to get over the hump and, and and get going in a positive direction, and I think we will. Um, but we could use some help uh, from our from our you know the loyal supporters that continue to to back us and support us, and and even in Florida we had a really good contingent of fans that that showed up and and were loud and proud and and gave us all that support. So uh, with this home stand, we're really going to need that support behind us and and to pick up our energy, especially with shorthanded roster. To, to be able to lay it out on the line, every single possession, it's going to be uh, extremely important. And back to Bellarmine, very well coached team, um, a, a team that presents uh, so many. I mean, each team presents different challenges. You know, Bellarmine has a a group that can. It seems to to be that you know that they, they all can shoot it. They all take care of the ball. They move the ball efficient. Uh, they keep it moving. Um, they, they very, very rarely do you ever see a ball screen, uh, but they really play well together. You know, uh, a team that's uh, veteran led, has got nine returning lettermen, four starters. So uh, they got a lot of a cohesive group and uh, probably not the most athletic group, but uh, the very cohesive group that can give you challenges on, on the, the defensive end. So open it up to questions. Questions for Coach? Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, go ahead, Justin. Coach, who won the bowling match? You know, it certainly wasn't me. I was doing a lot of experimentation with some spins and whatnot. So uh, I took an L to my son. I know that. And, uh, <laughs> I had to pay him some cash on the side because, uh, you know, you get to a point where they're old enough to to beat you. And, and that's a. Uh, that's a hit on your old on your old ego. So that's right. Yeah. I took an L to my son, but it seemed like everybody was having a good time in their respective lanes and I'm excited to see everybody, you know, come together and do some things outside of basketball. And and, you know, even uh Coach Damar had a ball of family in town. So he, you know, after we got done eating there, you know, at Kegler's together, uh, he'd had a bunch of them over to his house. So uh, it was a good, good day for everybody to, you know, get a good night's sleep in after the late return and and the fact that you know you, everybody slept probably till noon or or later it sounds like and and we spent the afternoon together and hopefully got a great night's sleep 
last night and now we're you know in the weight room and grinding in the weight room and and preparing for Bellarmine. Hey, uh, the, the the question I want to ask about uh, Bellarmine. Uh, I mean, you've dealt with scheduling directly for like what, like the, like the last four or five years at least, probably. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, with with what Coach Davenport does there with his non conference schedule, if you're a Power Five team, does it take anything more than a phone call to to schedule them? They're one of those teams that nobody really wants to play. And like I th even going back to the Missouri State game and, and the first thing that Dana had to say to me uh, was thank you. Uh, he said, thank you for, for playing us. We can't get anybody to play us. And some of these teams that uh, a lot of the power five schools do really uh, shy away from playing because they can cause a, a lot of problems for certain teams. And we've never really been in a team to shy away from competition or shy away from those teams that can, can help you uh, with your resume come March. So that's the type of approach we've had uh, scheduling. So whether we change that approach moving forward, uh, it, it all depends on how, you know, settled in we get with our roster and, and moving forward in terms of our growth. So um, certainly I probably would have scheduled a little differently knowing our circumstances. Right. Right. Uh, and going into the season with, with all the challenges and three starters down and, and playing a short bench, I would have scheduled a heck of a lot different knowing that, but um, that's where we're at. And it's, it's nobody's fault, you know, within our program right now, we're just trying to uh, get through this stretch and, and with minimal damage so we can get back to a, you know, as much as a full strength roster as we possibly can, given our circumstances. When you look at their schedule, Bellamine's schedule, what, what's your reaction? I mean, they've already played K-State and Washington. I think they got a trip to Utah coming up, a trip to BYU, play you guys. I think there's another Power 5 team on there somewhere, too. Louisville, well, I, I think they play Louisville, maybe. So, so many of these, uh, these teams, uh, they're playing for March. Yeah. Uh, so their non-conference really doesn't mean much to them because they're not looking at trying to get an at-large bid, which my understanding is they're in their fourth year of transition. So I don't even know if they could make the NCAA tournament anyway, even if they, they, they got the automatic bid. And you could correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I think they are in their fourth year of transition or or maybe they are eligible. I have to look that up. But uh, regardless, um, they're playing all these buy games because, you know, they have to go uh, – certain coaches have to raise a certain amount of money uh, with buy games uh, for their budget to maintain their budget. So they have to be bought by a certain amount of uh, high major teams uh, to get that number. Now, for uh, the, some of these teams, like I said, they're playing for March. So as battle tested as they can possibly be in the non-conference when they go to their conference and, and can understand who they are and, and what they have to do to compete and know more about their team going to their conference and they're playing for March and the only way to get to the NCAA tournament is to, to win in March and be that automatic qualifier, then that's kind of the approach they have. Thank you, Coach. Questions for Coach? Go ahead and unmute your line. Go ahead, Greg. It, Josh, uh, you mentioned more discipline down the stretch, finding a way to win. Ultimately, what does that take? Uh, I mean, how do you get that out of this group, especially with only having you know seven or eight available bodies right now? Um, film study reps. Uh, you, you know, there's a lot of things you can correct just by. Uh, simply, you know, say, for instance, our guards coming when they're stringing ball screens out and, and just keeping your dribble and not putting yourself in a position where you pick up your dribble against, uh, and you know, ACC, you know, def defensive player of the year. Um, and, and that's kind of what we did several times with our guard play. Uh, sometimes it's, it's not dribbling and, you know, getting that comfort dribble and when you receive the ball and making the quick pass. Uh, so we're making some – uh, mistakes from that end to where uh, if we just think of things differently and approach things differently um, and handle and a lot of these guys are put in positions they've never been put in before so they're trying to to get that comfort level so the more we can rep it uh, the more we can show them on film uh, some of them very simple things to clean up but it's just gotta it's gotta register you know with them and their basketball iq before we can clean it up
questions for coach? Go ahead, Hertz. Yeah, uh, coach. Uh, uh, everybody, everybody wants to know, I guess, uh, what you learn as a as a, as a team, you know, fundamentally and basketball wise. But what have you guys learned about yourselves uh, uh, by what's happened and and how it's transpired uh, to this point? I mean, hopefully. Uh, I mean, we certainly want to learn um, by winning. Uh, we have, we you don't want to learn by losing, uh, but you got to figure out how you learn regardless. And we certainly down the stretch, uh, you, you know, those discipline that we talked about, whether it be you know turning the ball over when we're trying to, you know, get it into the post on post entry pass or. Or, uh, you know, the discipline in terms of getting that rebound where you, you needed, you know, one stop and a rebound and you, and you got a chance to win the game with 10 seconds, 10, 12 seconds. I mean, that's critical moments. And I continue to talk to these guys over and over. This is a possession game. We have very, very little margin for error given our circumstances. Uh, so every single possession has to be a, a – a complete battle and, and you got to understand that that possession might be the possession that changes the game. Um, so uh, I credit to the guys for, for how much, how much they've, they've grown over the last five games, but regardless of saying that we're, we're two and three, we're two and three. So we got to figure out uh, how we even continue to grow even further until we can get some help to where uh, we're more of a complete team. Seems to me that possibly, uh, possibly, shall we say, uh, getting consistency. I mean, you've had Seth playing spurts, and you've had uh, uh, as hard and as good as uh, uh, Edwards has played. There's been moments where he hasn't. A part of that's obviously due to being tired, but part of it's also, you know, just a lack of consistency i guess is the way you put yeah, it we, we can't get too one-dimensional by any means you know we have to throw it into the post and we have to utilize jesse because he is you know our bread and butter in, in a lot of ways but we got to make shots uh, um you know surrounding him and we got to get those guys confident and, and i had that deep conversation with them at halftime you know i looked down the stat line and all of our shooters were over and um i'm like guys I mean, we, you got to understand, you guys are shooters. You're in there to play a role. Um, you got to play a lot of roles, but the, the main role is you got to make shots. Step up there with confidence and make shots. Nobody's trying to tell you not to shoot the ball. We want to take good shots, um, certainly, and we want to take shots at our offense, but we can't be the ones that are creating those things off the bounce. We got to create it for one another. And I tried to instill as much confidence as I could, uh, especially with the Seth and, and Kobe and, and Josiah had a rough game, never did uh, uh, get see one fall. Uh, but those guys got to figure out, you know, where their shots are coming from and, and what's a good shot, what's a bad shot. And I think they know, but I think at this point, you know, sometimes we've crippled them a little bit with, you know, you know, hounding them like, Without play with your instinct. At the end of the day, I need you to play with instinct. You're a shooter. Don't question a shot. If it's an open shot, you take it. Back to Justin. Hey, coach, I got uh, a two part question here, uh, and, and they're both kind of focused on the roster here. Um, obviously, the the challenge is shorthanded. Um, you know, and, and and four games, you're you're, you're getting back uh, Kerr, um, which obviously helps. Uh, but in your opinion, though, th I mean, there there are still shorthanded challenges to face, even when he comes back, isn't there? Yes, there's there's plenty of challenges still, and um, I'm not I'm not entirely, you know, I haven't lost all hope for Raekwon. I, I still think there's a possibility to see Raekwon, so I, I hope that uh, you know things change in that regard. Um, so. I have I'm I'm an optimistic person, an optimistic person. So I I see down the road that we got help with Kerr, definitely. Um, maybe no some of these tests and, and things that are going on with the Cook can give us, you know, an, an opportunity to see him back on the floor at some uh, some form or fashion. So uh, we're trying to figure that out in the meantime. And and Raekwon's situation is certainly not dead. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope that uh, the only thing I do know right now is Kerr's coming back in for four games. 
does that entirely help our our depth? Uh, it doesn't hurt anything whatsoever to have a point guard. Sure. To help sure. us. I think we're going to get a heck of a lot better shots, and he's going to create us a lot better shots. Not, and that's no knock on Kobe. Kobe's done an extremely uh, a, a great job given his circumstances, and so. Um, but to, to, to bring more depth to the guard position and, and a guy that's, uh, you know, been so proven and even in the last two years, you know, I think he led the Pac-12 in assists per game. So to have a guy like that getting people, you know, creating for people is going to be uh, extremely valuable to our offense. And you can see that based on our numbers and our production, even in the two games, whether it be Vanderbilt and George Mason, where we had Kerr to work with, uh, compared to the, the games we haven't, it's it's been uh, it's it's a huge difference, and just one guy not be able to, you know, run the show and create. The other question uh, was 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 about Raekwon, and I and I heard your statement after the um, Virginia game the other night with the his lawyers and his family lawyers are kind of taking it from here. Um, obviously the court system is, is not swift in this country and I'm not sure how something like this would go, but if it were to drag on and then all of a sudden you get to February or, or mid February and something happens where he could play, if it's that late in the season, is there a decision there to be made on your part on whether or not it would be Worth, yeah, I mean, worth him. Yeah. I've, I've, I've thought about that a lot. I mean, it's definitely yeah. a, if it is something that's drug out all, um, you know, too long, then it's going to be a decision whether what's best for Raekwon. Uh, and from my perspective, so much of this, and I'd love to see him on the floor and he could really help us and help sure. our team. But what's best for Raekwon is not happening by the NCAA. Um, I've, you know, it's a shame to see, you know, a kid that thrives on on hope and, and thrives on on having the game of basketball in his life and to be able to compete and and the people he inspires uh, in the Tulalip uh, reservation and and the, the people of his tribe. It's 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 dragging on him. It's it's a huge drag on him. And, and he's starting to I feel like he's starting to lose that hope. And I worry like hell. Uh, for Raekwon and and his uh, his his mindset, so um, it's sad. It's it's really sad, especially considering this. The you know he was the only Native American to play in the NCAA tournament last year. Yeah, and um, a kid that uh, I hate to say it like this, but sometimes I think if it was a, a blind resume of sorts uh, uh, with some of these 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 waivers, I think we would have got it approved. Um, but it, it's just a shame. It's, it's, a, it's a complete shame for, you know, the talk about the, the wellness and a uh, student athlete. And I don't think they've at one point, um, denied the fact that, that we have a mental health, uh, situation in this regard. And, and the fact that we still denied it or the NCAA, NCAA denied it twice is, is a crying shame. If you ask me. So if it does drag out, I mean, I I'm guessing you have a certain date or a point in your mind where it wouldn't make sense, even yeah, if you were clear. I that would be a, a decision I'd have to make with Raekwon in terms right. of doing the best by by him. And right now, uh, I just worry about his headspace and yeah, and and I love that kid to death, and and he's a, such an outstanding human being, and and he's went through a heck of a lot of challenges in his life, and. Uh, to have to go through not only losing his coach at, uh, at at Montana State to transferring here to you know I had a connection with him in the recruiting process but he came here to play for Coach Huggins and lost another coach and and I stepped in as that role and and good thing that we you know we had such a good relationship from day one but uh, he's went through two coaching changes in the right. last you know less than a year and here we are. I mean, we're not denying the fact that he has a mental health uh, issue, but we're still denying him the, the possibility to taking basketball out of his life for a year. It just doesn't make sense to me. And one, one last thing with the shorthanded roster. I mean, it's one thing for you guys to talk about it and, you know, for us to ask you questions about it. And, and you can, you know, obviously you, everyone can do math. 
Uh, the SMU game, though, was really kind of the first game where it probably felt uh, like a shorthanded uh, uh, kind of roster. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what were the reactions after that game? I'm sure everyone was tired and, and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, and, and then moving forward, um, you know, I mean, shorthanded is kind of going to be the, the the topic of discussion, you know, for the rest of the year almost. Uh, you know, how how – after that SMU game, how do you deal with it now moving forward? Well, first and foremost, I hope I hope our guys understand, and, and we've talked about it before, the only person that's played big minutes in their career has been Jesse Edwards. So looking back now, you know, Seth has played big minutes now for five games. Yeah, Toby has. Josiah has. Hopefully we get – ourselves more accustomed to playing these big minutes to where uh, we feel like we're more comfortable with the the rotation and the role we're in. We got to play the hand we're dealt right now. This is the hand we're dealt. Uh, so we got to figure that out back to the SMU game. Yes. They kind of took advantage of us. They had the numbers. They had the right. numbers. Right. They, they could, they could make it a very physical, very physical game. And they did. I mean, that was smart on his part. He could, he could throw guys at Jesse all night long and foul, foul and foul and foul and make them call it because he had no problem with his guys being in foul trouble. He could just send another athlete at another us. Guy in. Now, where it really came into play, and, and I could have probably done better a better job uh, from a coaching perspective, was in that second half when we were breaking the press, which, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Had we, you know, back some of those uh, – you know, disadvantage or advantage situations where we got numbers and we broke the press rather than attack, we maybe probably should have pulled it out and, and ran some offense and slowed it down. And, uh, but that's a double edged sword too. If, if sure. you know, the way we we're playing, if we're, we we're up 11 at halftime, had we converted early in the second half and stretched that out to a, you know, a, you know, 18, 20 point lead, uh, that might have, might have been a heck of a lot different ball right. game too. They might have backed out the pressure. So we were very aggressive against their against their pressure early in the second half. We just didn't convert. You know, we had several opportunities and layups at the rim that we didn't convert. And so knowing that, you know, that, that we didn't convert, it would have been smarter that uh, we back it out and kind of slow it down and, and run more offense rather than getting up and down ball game like we did. Coach, I think that's all the time we have for today. I appreciate your time today, and thanks to everyone for calling in. Thank you.